<coughs> Excuse me. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath, that we can rest from our labors and focus more on you and your plan. Father, as we look at some things today, we ask that you would grant us the understanding that we need Because here in these last days, things are happening so fast. And we need your guidance, your wisdom, in order to get through. And as we study your word today, we ask for your spirit that inspired it to be with us that we can rightly divide it. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, so some things came up last time we are here. And I just wanted to go into it a little bit because... You know, we were, we were operating under the premise that the events connected with the close of probation, would, which would be the end of judgment, the close of probation are clearly portrayed in the prophecies. And we've talked about why that is. The obvious reason is, is if the judgment that happens during the time, and I'm I'm just going to get up and and go over this just a little bit more, uh, just so we can see it. We've been talking about these different time periods, and we saw in Daniel 7 that during the time that the little horn is doing its speaking, judgment happens. Now, why God has put the judgment contained within the prophecies, number one, The judgment happens in heaven before Yeshua comes back. So if the judgment happens in heaven, he wants people to know on earth. So he's got prophecies and he's got the festival calendar tucked into the prophecies so that those that are studying the prophecies and understand the festival calendar, and when I say understand the festival calendar, It's not enough to keep the festivals. I I really want to emphasize this. And I know I'm talking to the choir. But I really need to emphasize the idea. It's not enough to keep the festivals. You have to understand the typology of the festivals. How can we learn from history? We can learn this from history. If we look at God's people 2,000 years ago, they rushed home to keep the Passover, to celebrate their Passover, to sacrifice their four-legged lamb, and they wanted to make sure that Yeshua got down off the cross so that no one would be defiled and they wouldn't be able to eat the Passover. So when the fulfillment of the Passover sacrifice was in plain sight, they missed it. And so what happened? Well, we know the rest of that story. I propose that if we do not understand the meaning and the types as to how they're going to be fulfilled and when they're going to be fulfilled, then we could very well repeat the story of ancient Israel. And it looks like that is the way it's going to be. It was Satan and his angels, I believe, that inspired the leaders, the Jewish leaders at that time, to crucify Yeshua. Can we learn a lesson there? Well, could it be that the leaders and those that think they're leaders of God's people would crucify those that have the correct understanding. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we see that very clearly. Those that have the word of God and are dividing it correctly and are in possession of the spirit of prophecy, they're the ones that get persecuted. So that's the team that we want to find ourselves on. And we don't want to find ourselves on the team that thinks they have it all figured out. When in fact they don't. And that's told in Revelation chapter 3. They claim. These are people that claim to be followers of God. They have it all figured out. And they claim that they are in need of nothing. 
This sounds a lot like the Jewish leaders back in the time of Yeshua. They were in such need of nothing. They knew it not that they, that's what it says. You know not that you are blind, poor, miserable, and so on. The fact is they needed everything. And they needed the spirit of prophecy that inspired so they would know what was going on. But so many people are bracing themselves against the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And for the most part, because it's different than what they thought it would be. Now, that's a serious thing. If we have things come to us that are different than what we think should happen, just because we think it, it doesn't mean that it's true. So it would behoove us to have a look, have just a little look, enough to see that it's not true. And how do we measure? We measure by the word of God. That's what it says in the book of Revelation, that they had the word of God. That's why John was on the island of Patmos. He says, your fellow in the tribulation, this is what we're going to have, tribulation. Same thing. We're going to have to stand on God's word only and be in possession or hold on to, it says, the spirit of prophecy. So this is what we want. So with that, let's jump into this. We were looking at judgment, and the idea is that seven last plagues will be poured out at judgment. And we saw the, the pattern in the Exodus story. Uh, we looked at that. But also, there's only two groups. At the close of judgment, it will be determined who is righteous and who is not. And the wicked, according to the book of Revelation in chapter 16, they bear the brunt of the seven last plagues. And that's God's mercy to his people because it causes a great distraction from the persecution that they are feeling. And so I'm kind of looking at the seven last plagues a lot differently. That's God's gift to his people, actually, at the end of time, because it's one way that he's going to protect them uh, from the evil ones and that are trying to destroy them. So that being said, if the close of judgment happens and there's no more salvation, then how do, do the other feasts, okay? We have the beginning of trumpets. We looked at the, the 10 days between those. Somebody asked about the 10 days last time. Well, that 10 days is the, the opening and the closing of judgment between trumpets and the Day of Atonement. But what prepares people for that time? That's what we want to look at. We know some things about Pentecost. And I want to look at that right here. We want to look at some typology. So we want to look at what has gone before us. We understand that at Pentecost, very likely, it looks like, that at Pentecost, God poured out his spirit on all flesh. That's what it says. That's what we're going to look at. But if we go back before that time, when the, when the law was given to God's people, it looks like it could very well have been at Pentecost. And this makes a lot of sense, as we're going to see here in a couple of uh, minutes, is that if God gave his law, he would have to give us the ability to keep it. Would you agree with that? So there would have had to been an outpouring of the Spirit in order for us to keep God's law or for ancient Israel to keep God's law. And we know that this is the work of the Spirit, as we're going to see here in a moment. So in Acts chapter 2, we see something very interesting. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, or almost come, or within a week of coming? No, it says, when it had fully come. They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, a couple things here. I want to look at this idea here, when they were all in one place, all with one accord. 
God's people are going to have a unity like this in the time of the end. And the Spirit is going to work on the hearts of people, and the gospel will become the most important thing uh, in the minds of God's people in the time of the end, and sharing it, sharing that gospel as well. So I want to notice here that in verse 2, there was a sign that was given here. What was the sign? Suddenly there came a sound from where? From heaven. A rushing mighty wind. We see this in the book of Revelation. When a festival time happens, there's thunderings and earthquakes and great hail. There's always a sign that accompanies a fulfillment or an application of a festival calendar when it becomes a pinnacle point in the plan of salvation. This was a pinnacle point in the plan of salvation. Why do I say that? It's because Yeshua had died, he had rose, and he went back to heaven to intercede as our priest in the heavenly sanctuary. That would be a pinnacle event or a series of pinnacle events and this was the message that they took to the people at that time. Very important. And we know what happened. We're going to look at that. So this mighty wind that they all, and the whole house where they were sitting, it filled the whole house. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. Now, it doesn't say Fire, someone could argue and say, well, it wasn't fire. It was kind of like fire. Well, I'm not going to argue that point. It says as of fire, so I'm just going to take it, take it for that. goes on to say, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. Okay, so this is the emergency that God has. The people were Hebrews, whether they spoke Aramaic or Hebrew. Some of them probably spoke Greek. I don't know exactly. And it really doesn't matter. But what they were given was the ability to speak in the languages of all all the nations. We can't miss that. That's, that's extremely important. What were they going to do? They were going to give what they understood to be the accomplishment or the fulfillment of this part of the gospel. They weren't preaching the second coming had come, but they were preaching that Yeshua had come, he died, he rose, and he went to heaven. That's what they were preaching. And they said, when he's finished doing his work, restoration of all things will happen. They didn't understand when that would happen. They thought it would be soon. Uh, it's really irrelevant what they were preaching to all these people from every nation. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they're confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. So... You know, there's all these ideas about what the gift of tongues is and what it isn't. But if we just take this, it says they spoke. Um, they, were, they began to speak in other tongues, and it kind of defines it here. Everyone heard them speak, the disciples speaking, in his own tongue. It doesn't say that they were hearing it in their own language. It says that the disciples were speaking in their own language goes on to say, um, Yeshua said in 4 verse 1, Then Yeshua, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So here now we're kind of graduating a little bit here. These people were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were giving the message that God had given for that time. And it was poured out exactly at the right time, uh, pointed out on the festival calendar. In another place where I was reading in Luke, it says that Yeshua was filled 
with the Holy Spirit. So Yeshua was filled, and then it says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Where do God's people go in the time of the end? It says that they go into the wilderness to hide from the face of the serpent. However, Yeshua was led into the wilderness, but the serpent followed him into the wilderness, and we know what happened. I would propose that the devil is not finished with us when the fulfillment of the infilling of the Holy Spirit happens in the time of the end. We are not there yet. If I have this, uh, this cup here that you can all see, it's this full of water. If I had an empty cup and I was filling it, it's being filled with the Holy Spirit or the water, water of life. It's being filled. It doesn't mean that the filling happens instantaneously. The filling, the filling of the Holy Spirit is the work of a lifetime. But the idea is, is at the time of the end, the Holy Spirit will fill, will fill people. And who are these people? We want to look at that a little bit today. Acts chapter 2, 17 goes on to say, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. How much flesh? All flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall dream or shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men's maidservants and on my men's, or sorry, and on my men's servants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. What's the purpose of the Spirit? It's twofold. I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will take out the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and judgments and do them. This is really important here. Those people that are ready for the fullness of the Spirit will receive it at Pentecost. And they will go forward at that time and give what Revelation calls a loud cry. And they will go out and they will go into all the world because the world's not coming to them at this time. They're going to go into all the world as a witness, and then the end will come. It's going to be very critical at that time that those that are filled with the Holy Spirit will have the same gift because the first Pentecost, or should I say the Pentecost that the disciples experienced, would be actually, I can't really say that that was the first, obviously, but... Um, they experienced the filling of the Spirit so that they could spread the gospel message at that time to those that had come on from all those nations. Those that experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at this time, and of course every year at Pentecost, I believe, at every feast we have a little more of the Spirit coming into our lives as we surrender our lives, should I say, in incrementally, is that okay to say that? We give ourselves to him, but he's always revealing things that we can do differently. And so during our life, we slowly give ourselves completely into his hands. At the time of the end, there's a group of people that have done that. They've done it successfully. We've talked about that. And they have the fullness of the Spirit. They are sealed, as in completely sealed, not partially sealed. If you're partially sealed, you can still be saved, but you're just not completely sealed. These people have come to the place in their life where the fulfillment of Ezekiel happens in their life. He says, I put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Why is this important at that time? 
because we're coming to judgment. Pentecost is about four months before judgment. They're infilled with the Holy Spirit. They're keeping God's law. So at the time of judgment, when judgment closes, there's no more mediator for sin. In other words, you can't sin anymore because there's no intercession uh, going on in the heavenly sanctuary. Why? Because Yeshua has left the sanctuary. This is a typology when we go back to chapter 16 of Leviticus and also chapter 9 of Hebrews, which is a parallel to Leviticus. It's actually exposing what Leviticus chapter 16 was all about, the high priest ministry on the Day of Atonement, pointing forward to a time in the time of the end where judgment would actually happen, and the priest would at that time change his garments and put on different garments. I would propose that Yeshua is going to be awarded a kingly garment at that time, and he will forever put down his priestly robes uh, at that time. So that means there's no more high priest in the sanctuary, in the heavenly sanctuary, doing a work of forgiveness. So therefore, those people that get through, that have this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and I'm saying the fullness because he pours out on all flesh, as a last call for all people of the world, but some reject, some accept, but those that are completely filled go forward and give that last call to this world before Yeshua comes back. And we've got some texts for that we're going to look at. So when, they, when these people get past here, these people that have been totally filled with the Holy Spirit, they are numbered. It's very interesting. It says in the book of Revelation chapter 7 that they are, these people are sealed with the Holy Spirit and it numbers them as 144,000 that are completely sealed. There's something else that I found interesting here. As another example of these people, Luke chapter 1 verse 5 and 6, and there in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the vision of Abijah, his wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And we know who they were. What does it say that they were? Let's, let's keep going here. It says that they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. What does it say? Partially? Blameless. They were perfectly obeying every move that the Holy Spirit caused them to make. Why, why them? What is it that was special about them? They were going to give birth between the two of them, and we know the miracles around that, they were going to give birth to the one that Yeshua would say was the greatest prophet. The greatest prophet would need the greatest parents. And these two people had qualified, if you will, had qualified themselves to give birth to the forerunner of the Messiah. Now, follow me here. This person was to prepare the way of the Lord. I want to ask you, those people that are filled with the Spirit at the last Pentecost, what are they doing? They are preparing the way of the Lord. See, it's, it's and, and I'm just going to go out and say it, is their job actually is more important, if you can handle this, it's more important than John the Baptist's job at the first coming. Because if you miss the second time, you've missed everything. You see, when John came and preached and was murdered, there was still salvation after that. 
But there is no salvation after this. So those people have been called by God to be his representatives of his kingdom, his heavenly kingdom, and they are going to obey God in every aspect of their life so that they can give the last warning message to the people of this world. They will be completely filled with the Spirit. And we've looked at the the idea that these people are the 144,000 Because it says of them, who's able to stand and face Yeshua when he comes, and then the number of those were of the 144,000. So we see some direct parallels here, um, and how the the importance of the, the Pentecostal experience in the early church was just a type of what's going to happen Uh, just in front of us. So let's look at this where we're talking about here in Revelation chapter 7. After these things, I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any, on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Do not harm the earth, the sea, the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. The seal of God is given to the servants of God in their forehead. Why in their forehead? That's where their mind is. The mark of the beast is said to be in the hand and in the forehead. Same thing. It's a counterworking. The mark of God seals his law in their forehead, and they will no longer disobey God on anything. They are sealed to get through this time and through the greater time uh, of tribulation Uh, after probation has closed. So it goes on to say who these are and the number of those who were sealed. And and I don't know if I can, um, you know, I think it's correct where it says that we're sealed. That's a, um, a finishing. So they were sealed. The sealing process, as I was looking at, at, at the cup, It's a sealing process at the point where the Holy Spirit, we're told that the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of our salvation. So once the Holy Spirit is being poured into our lives, we have a guarantee of our salvation. As long as we don't pull the cup away from the Spirit. As long as we hold uh, in, in the line of fire, if you will, the Holy Spirit, then he will complete the job, he who has finished the work, or he who has started the work, will finish it. So these people have started the work of being infilled with the Holy Spirit, and God's going to finish that work. And they are numbered to be 144,000. That's who we're striving to be among. We may, may not be among them, but if we strive to be among the 144,000, in my mind, that would most likely qualify us for salvation. Even if we're not alive and standing when Yeshua comes back, if we have strove to be among that category of people, then there's a good chance our salvation is secure. So striving among them would be a great idea to be among them. So it talks about that they are of the children of Israel who were sealed, and I'm not going to get into that Uh, discussion. Um, It's debated on who these people are. I'm just of the mind, I'll just put this out there, that if you are Christ, according to what Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, I believe, somewhere in there, if you are Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So in my mind, 
Israel was of Abraham's seed. And we are adopted into the family of Israel. And this is what Second uh, or Ephesians chapter 2 talks about. The Gentiles become part of the household of faith uh, because they're adopted into Israel. This is very clear in Ephesians chapter 2. And, and Paul, of course, that's Paul again. And he's, he's quite clear, especially when he says all Israel will be saved. Does that mean that everyone that's of the bloodline, a descendant of Israel, will be saved? No. Israel, the name itself, tells us who those people are. Overcomer with God are those that have got the victory um, over themselves and over sin with the power of the Spirit working in their lives. So they are truly the house of Israel in the time of the end. Bloodline is not going to make any difference at all. It's those who choose to be under the umbrella of our king, Yeshua. So these are the ones that are sealed in the time of the end. And I want to say again, if you're not of the 144,000, it doesn't mean that you're not saved. It just means that you haven't been completely filled with the Spirit because those that are completely filled of the Spirit are going to have a different experience than those that have not been completely filled with the Spirit. And one of those things is living on earth without a mediator after he leaves the sanctuary. And this is when they become the first and foremost target of the wicked. And as I said, it's a good thing that the plagues are poured out on the wicked, it distracts them, but still they will get the attention. If we will look in the story of Job, the story of Job actually is another type in the Bible where Satan came to the father and he said, you know what, I got everything in, under control on the earth and God reminds them of one individual it would seem that he had the whole world. It's kind of like the time of Noah. It would seem that Noah and his sons and their wives and Noah's wife were the only ones righteous. It says all flesh had corrupted its way. So it seems that at the time of Job, it was very similar to that again. And then God uh, pointed out that he hadn't checked out his servant Job. Well, Satan had checked out the servant, his servant Job. But he could not get Job to sin. That was the problem. That's why he didn't claim victory over Job. And we know the discussion. There was two discussions, two meetings, where Satan was given, uh, uh, was given uh, authority or being allowed to, uh, to put, in, put Job under severe test. And God wouldn't do it, but he said, uh, you know, Satan... Uh, those that are standing around in this meeting that we're having would like to see what you would do with Job. And it, was <clears throat> it really demonstrated what Satan was made of. So he went back to, back to earth from the heavenly court and he started tormenting Job. Why was this? It's a good question. The only thing that I can think of is that God was allowing Job to be put under the test to demonstrate something. It was to demonstrate that no matter what pressure he would come under from Satan himself and his cronies, that Job was solid as a rock. Could it be in the time of the end that God allows Satan and all of his minions to demonstrate their power and authority over the world in that they will be given permission by God to do what they can do to God's people. And this we know there's going to be a great persecution. Uh, we see this. We've looked at those verses in the book of Revelation. This is to destroy the faith of God's people. And that's why he's doing it. Same experience with Job. But Job, it says he didn't even sin with his mouth. And this is what uh, the 144,000 are going to go through, I believe, in the time of the end. God will allow them to come under the ire of the devil 
to demonstrate something. What is God going to demonstrate? He's going to demonstrate that his plan was perfect, that he can restore the image of God in man. And that's what he's going to do. These people, the 144,000, will be like Yeshua, and they will be able to say, not in a bragging sense, but they will be able to say that the devil has nothing in me. And this has to be demonstrated uh, by God's people in the time of the end. Those that have not been completely filled with the Spirit are not able to say that. They will not be able to say that. It doesn't mean that they won't be saved. It just means that this is definitely a special group of people that will be in the time of the end. And they will go and give that last message to man before the judgment. <clears throat> Where do we see this in the book of Revelation? Revelation 8 verse 1. Let's start there. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. I'm going to get into this time frame. I'm just going to take it for what it says, a half an hour. It's like everyone gasped at this time. And not a pin, or only a pin could be heard. If it dropped on the floor, it was silent. What was going on? I saw the seven angels who stand before God. To them were given seven trumpets. This is not good. Then another angel, given a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. And he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. We know here that this has to be an appointed time because nothing happened in the earthly sanctuary without an appointed time being around it. And so we know that this has to do with the heavenly sanctuary. There's something happening in the courts of heaven at this time. So the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer. What did the censer have? The censer had live coals of fire. When the incense was put on there, the smoke of that incense was representing the, the prayers of the saints ascending up, for, up to God. He filled it with fire from off the altar and threw it to the earth. And there was noises, thunderings, lightning, and an earthquake. This is so we know on earth that something major just happened in heaven. Another pinnacle event. I would propose that this is the last uh, Pentecost before. This is when the coals off the altar, we see this in Isaiah, take a live coal off the altar and touch the tongue of Isaiah. And you want to read that story in chapter 6. There's some really uh, good parallels there to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Then the angel took the center, filled it with fire from off the altar, and threw it to the earth. So the fire of heaven has been thrown to the earth. What fire is it? Just any old fire? No, it's from off the altar. This is the same fire, I believe, that was given to the disciples when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. We know, as we saw in Revelation eleven nineteen. let's just turn there again. 11, uh, Revelation 11, verse 19 it says, then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the Ark of the Covenant was seen in the temple and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. This is to indicate that something major happened in heaven. And we talked about this verse before. This has to be the Day of Atonement. So on festival timing, we see this happening. 
And, you know, people that have thought that the Day of Atonement happened uh, back in time, they, they miss the fact that when the Day of Atonement comes and people are starting to be judged at the uh, trumpets and atonement, there's going to be indicators on earth to let us know that. That's what the prophecies say. The effect of the Spirit of Yeshua, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When Yeshua at, was asked the question, but he, um, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? He goes on and gives all the events, which is what we've talked about here, all through this. And then he says in verse 13 of Matthew 24, but he who endures to the end. I'll get you just to go back to the, the board here, please. So Yeshua starts Matthew 24 with this. We've talked about all of this, getting right into it. And Yeshua says at verse 13, just before he's going to close the prophetic um, events, he says, but he who endures to the end, that's all the way down here, will be saved. So this word enduring shows up in Revelation again. In Revelation chapter 6, it talks about the endurance of the saints. And it describes who they are. They are they that keep the commandments of God. You see how the commandments of God plays right into it, those that endure to the end. They are obedient to God's commandments. He who endures to the end or holds on to the end will be saved and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Well, I have this question in my mind. Are there going to be people of all nations that are giving this message at the time of the end? Well, it really doesn't matter if they're from every nation. What matters is... They're of the 144,000 who have received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to do this work in all nations. That would mean, that would very likely mean that they would have the gift of tongues at this time to finish the work. Why do they need the gift of tongues? Because there is only so much more time left until the end. How are they going to get it done? If we look in Revelation, the earth is an absolute disaster. They probably won't be able to catch a plane or catch a boat anywhere, but they will be airlifted just like Philip was airlifted when he gave the message to the eunuch. And then it says he was lifted, basically, to a place uh, many miles away. This is a type, again, if you will, of the work that people are going to give uh, at the, near the second coming when God will airlift them, uh, catch them away in the spirit, kind of like Elijah again, when he was caught up in the chariot, chariot of fire, and, uh, and taken. This is exactly the same thing that God's going to do in the time of the end. All these stories are for us upon whom the end of the ages have come. God has the ability to work uh, many miracles in order to get this job done, and that's exactly what he's going to do. All of this was in the answer to the question, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, uh, it said he, er, they, they were asking him, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? So God gave... Yeshua, an understanding of this, which he shared to the disciples, whom did not receive or um, go through the events foretold, but it was for us uh, just before he comes back. And this is the purpose here. Then I saw another angel, Revelation 14, 6, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And here we see again, if God's people are going to give this message, very likely they're going to have the gifts of the Spirit to do that. 
They were saying, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heavens and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So we can see here the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is in preparation to give this last message of mercy uh, to take one side or the other. It will be a dividing, a demarcation between who are gods and who are not. So I want to get back into where it talks about Revelation, where the outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, comes. So we're back in chapter 9 now. This is following on the heels of chapter 8 when um, the uh, coals off the altar, the fire off the altar is thrown to the earth. Then the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth and to him. Now the, the star is personified in a hymn, was given the key to the bottomless pit. So this uh, being, and he opened the bottomless pit, the smoke arose out of the pit like the sound or the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. To them was given power as scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass, the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those who, have, who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Now these, this text is very interesting to me. Um, I have an idea how this is getting worked out, and we might just look at that here for, for a moment. They were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Oh boy. Who are the them that are desiring to die? If... This parallels, and I'm just going to say if, I think it's something and it's worthy to consider. If the story of Job parallels God's people in the time of the end, Satan will be focused on these people to destroy them, to get them rid of uh, from the earth, and then he will claim the victory that everyone on the planet is under his control and they are worshiping him, and he is the rightful ruler of this planet. But evidently, that's not the way it's going to turn out, and that's the story of Job, is that Satan did not have everyone under his control. Uh, Job was tormented by Satan, uh, but Satan was told that he was not allowed to take Job's life. He could torment him, but he was not allowed to take his life. You can read this two different ways, and I've been challenged on this, and that's okay. You can read it that people are being tormented by Satan, evil people are being tormented by Satan, but they are not allowed to be killed by Satan. Well, it doesn't appear that that's the way Revelation uh, goes forward, it seems like there's a lot of people that die under the control of Satan. But could it be that the people that it's talking about here, that Satan is not allowed to kill, he's allowed to torment them, but he's not allowed to kill them, just as in the story of Job. If God protected his people to the point where Satan had no effect on them whatsoever. They escaped, escaped all the trials and tribulations of the enemy at this time. Then what is actually God proving? Doesn't he have to prove his people in the time of the end? 
I would say absolutely he has to prove them. He has to test them, just like he tested Job. But they will not be, uh, the evil ones will not be able to take their life. And this also parallels Job's experience, where Job wanted to die. He said, cursed is the day that he was born. And that's wishing he was dead. And that he didn't have to go through what he was going through. Is it possible that God's people will be under so much distress and torment by the evil one that they may just want to die? How many people, and I don't want anyone to raise their hands, how many people at times have had enough of this life and they just want to take a sleep until Yeshua comes back? We haven't seen anything yet. We are going to be reduced to less than the shirts on our back. I believe that we will be ultimately mocked for our abject poverty. What does that mean? Abject poverty. That means we will be, we will be less than the least of all the people on the earth. If we're mocked for our abject poverty, wouldn't that have to mean that God has taken away every earthly support? Isn't that what that means? Is that we will have nothing. And that's kind of like where Job found himself. In fact, he was at a place where he was scraping the boils that were inflicted by Satan with a potsherd or a broken pot to scrape them off. You know, it's very interesting, and I've said this before, it's very interesting that if Job's scenario that he found himself in is just a type of what God's people are going to find themselves in, you want to check out the first plague. Let's check out the first plague, shall we? Chapter 16 of the book of Revelation. Chapter 16, verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of wrath on the earth, or wrath of God on the earth. So the first went out and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. I want to ask a question. Do you think God's people in the time of the end, when the plagues are poured out, is that, do you think that they have the assurity that they are saved? Do you think that they're going to be able to stand up and say, I've done everything right. I'm good to go with God. Are they going to say that? No. no. The book of Ezekiel, it says they will loathe themselves because of their sins. They will have this heavy burden that have they got through the judgment and be on the right side. This is the reality of it. Is it possible, and i just throwing this out there, is it possible that Satan gives these people, inflicts these people with boils, and when they get these boils like uh, Job had, that they think that this is the mark of the beast punishment as foretold in Revelation? Are they so sure of their salvation that they would believe that there's no way? Job did not know who was inflicting him, but he said, he said, though he slay me, I will serve him. You see, in the time of the end, it doesn't matter what happens to God's people. Even if they're slain because God sees fit to slay them, 
they understand the righteousness of God in doing it. Now, this is incredible in my mind now. Get this picture of the righteous. They know the filthiness of their life. They are doing the best they can through the power of the Holy Spirit to be saved. But they know not if they've come out on the right side of the judgment because they understand their unworthiness to be saved. And they express, as Job did, you know what? If God sees fit that I can't go to his kingdom, I accept that because God knows whether I should go or not. This is the mentality of the righteous. This is actually what qualifies them to be saved. Are you with me? This is what qualifies the righteous to be saved. They understand their sinfulness. They understand their unworthiness. They have been reduced to nothing. And they claim that if God deems to slay them, they will be happy with that because God alone is righteous and he will do what the righteous thing is to do. This is what qualifies them actually to make it through. This is all happening through this time. Uh, and of course, Job had lots of friends that came and encouraged him greatly. Really? <laughs> Not? You know, the wicked will be tormenting us uh, all through this time. And we will question as to whether we are saved or not. We go on in uh, Revelation 9, uh, verse 10. And they had these scorpions came out of this bottomless pit. And they, they had tails like scorpions. And there were stings in their tail. Their, their power was to hurt men five months. Okay. So here's another time. Uh, in here, and they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, those whose, uh, whose name was in the Hebrew Abaddon, but in the Greek he was named Apollyon. Both these words, one Hebrew, one Greek, basically mean the same thing, the destroyer. So the destroyer now has taken full control. How has that happened? At trumpets and the Day of Atonement, we know that at 1260, we know that there's no more Babylon. Babylon the Great has been destroyed by the kings of the earth. And this Apollyon takes over, it says. At, at judgment, he takes over. Now, it looks like if we can do some math here, if trumpets happens, we've looked at this 1150, this would happen at what day? If uh, Day of Atonement is 1150, trumpets would be what? Ten days. It would be at 1140. If we can fit this together, we have a 1290 day period. If you take 1290, subtract uh, 1140, you're going to come up with 150 days, which is five months. And it looks like from the time of judgment, Satan takes effect on this planet. Now, that's kind of interesting because he sees that the uh, harlot is destroyed. A lot of people think that the harlot is still around at the second coming, but clearly in Revelation 17 that the ten kings make war against the harlot and they destroy the harlot. So the ten kings go forward after that and Satan takes control during that time. So Satan will actually be reigning. This is what this looks like to me. Satan will have this key to the bottomless pit. Yeshua talked about the pit. The angel said, don't send us into the pit. Evidently, there's some special ops type angels that have been held in for, with chains, Yeshua talks about, and they will be released. Satan released them. So he will have 
all the effect of all the evil angels and all the evil people to persecute and try and destroy uh, God's people in this last days. Because the 1140 is 10 days prior to the 1150, and you've got exactly the same time period where the 1290 says from the time the daily is taken away and the abomination of desolation set up, which is Apollyon. So he takes the throne of the kingdom of earth at 1290. So the point is that if this, all the math is right, but if we're applying it correctly, this would have to be correct because if the 1150 is right, then that would mean the 2300 evenings and mornings is actually 1150. When we take away the 10 and start that with judgment, it is exactly five months until, the, uh, until Satan is set up on the throne of this world. And that's, that's pretty interesting because everyone is looking for the Messiah to come when? When are they looking for the Messiah to come? In the fall. So five months before, uh, Satan, it seems, according to the book of Revelation, shows up here five months uh, before he's enthroned to do his work of convincing the people who he is trying to be. And that would be their Messiah. And, of course, everyone's going to be looking for a Messiah at this point. Uh, and we can see why in the book of Revelation, this earth is going to be reduced to, uh, to nothing, pretty much. When Satan, when Satan, the abomination of desolation set up, that's the same power that is in Revelation where it talks about um, this abomination of desolation is called Abaddon or uh, Apollyon, the destroyer. When he is set up, that is the abomination of desolation. There are 45 more days on this planet before Yeshua comes back. Deliverance is on day 1335, and he's at 1290. So we're going to know, and here again, this is the mercy of God. We're going to know when he sets up, that's when it says, when Yeshua said in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, standing in the holy place in Jerusalem as the king of kings, the masquerading of the king of kings, uh, he said, those in Judea better get out of town. Well, it's going to be like that over the whole world because he will take up headquarters in Jerusalem as the coming of the Messiah. And the ten kingdoms will embrace uh, this power that comes because they're going to believe that it is uh, Yeshua come back to reign here on this earth. And this is the deception. This is the grand deception of all time. Yeshua coming back as the angel uh, or the messenger of the covenant and, of course, his covenant will be quite different than the real covenant. And people will be following him. And, of course, they will be sinful, so they are going to love all the things that he has to say. So those, and I, I just want to throw a little bit of a twist into here. If this is correct, and I say this in all due respect, if this is correct... And this is actually the spirit revealing this information. How many spirits are there? Many spirits have gone into the world, it tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, I think it is. Many spirits have gone into the world, and it says many false prophets. So the false spirits inspire the false prophets. But there is only one Holy Spirit. If this equation that I've got out here is Holy Spirit inspired that would mean that anyone that opposes this would be inspired by a different spirit are you following with me 
The spirit is not the spirit of confusion. God's not the author of confusion. There is only one truth. Somebody told me the other day, well, there's lots of possibilities. No, 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 no. There is only one possible fulfillment of scripture when it comes to these end time prophecies. It's not like over there and over here and spiritual application and all this. The reason why people love spiritual applications of prophecy is because they've never been able to see the events foretold come to pass. So because they want to think they're in the time of the end, they'll take a prophecy and they'll spiritualize it away. Because when you spiritualize something away, you can't really prove it. But when it actually is fulfilled, a direct fulfillment, beast for beast, earthquake for earthquake, hailstone for hailstone, we're talking complete fulfillment of this prophecy. So, I say again, for clarity, if this is inspired by the Holy Spirit, any opposition to this would be someone that's bracing themselves against the spirit of prophecy. In other words, the spirit will be poured out all around them and they will brace themselves to resist it. Why? Because it's not what they thought was going to happen. And their criteria for all truth is what they believe. You see the danger in that? God always works in mysterious ways, and sometimes he takes us by surprise. And so my point being is, Yeshua said, my sheep hear my voice. If people have become accustomed to listening to other things, other things, other than what the Spirit is inspiring, they're not listening to the voice of Yeshua, and they don't know his voice. They've been accustomed to listening to another spirit, and so when what they thought was going to happen happens a different way, when they thought that Yeshua was coming in the fall, and a counterfeit Yeshua comes in the fall, what do you suppose they're going to do? They're going to accept the counterfeit through here because they've become accustomed to listening to the false spirit. And so when the voice of Yeshua calls them through the 144,000, they will reject again. Why will they reject? Because what they see has deceived them. Yeshua says, don't look at this abomination of desolation when he comes. They will look and they will see and their eyes will make their mind believe something uh, that is not true. Just the same way Eve was deceived because of what she saw, it says. She knew the truth or had been told what the truth was, but she didn't believe it, and she took another road uh, because of what she saw. So the, at the end of time, God is going to unleash hell, if you will, on this planet to demonstrate those who will follow him all the way and those who will not follow him all the way. Now, I don't know where your head is at right now, but I wake up sometimes at 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock in the morning and my mind is flooding with how serious this matter is about salvation. And I'm thinking, oh, these people have no clue what's coming. And you think about your children, your grandchildren, those that are close to you, and you just think, how am I going to tell these people? It's not a lot of good news. So we need some good news in all this. And we're going to get to that. Hang on. We're going to get to some good news yet. It says in verse 5 that they were not given authority to kill them. I believe they're not given authority. These evil ones are not given authority to kill God's people. And they will seek death, but it, they will not, it will not be found. Then in verse 11 it says, 
They had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is Abaddon, but in the Greek he is named Apollyon. So the counterfeit comes at a substitute time. He changes times and laws. Ultimately, Satan changes the times and laws. He gets people to think that something's going to happen at a certain time when it's actually not going to happen at a certain time. Why? To deceive the whole world. That's why he's doing it. The deception that he's coming in the fall, as far as I can tell, is one of the most ooh, sinister deceptions that he has. It's how he's going to get the world to worship him. And, uh, and this is what he's going to use. He's actually going to use God's calendar to do it. So here we have this, um, this slide here. This is on our website. I think it might even be on our downloads if you want this. This goes through here. And, of course, you can't put everything. You know, you see these end time charts and they got all these verses on. This is kind of a summary from the time the daily's taken away. Of course, uh, you go back to the war, starts the whole thing. Um, and you'll see another chart if you go look in our, our charts. I believe it's still there. I've got a friend of mine. Did you? Is it still there? A friend of mine um, was really good at um, Excel program, and he built. Uh, we both worked on it, and he kind of put together some thoughts that I was giving him on this chart. It's quite a large chart, quite comprehensive, and it goes through. It kind of goes through all of this. Uh, it gives you text and uh, all the references, not all of them, but a great many references. And at the top of the chart, it says something about seven years. We had some, a lot of discussion. Now, he has a history in the Baptist church, and um, I think a couple other churches knows a lot of people that believe in the rapture, this type of thing. And uh, not that he believes that. He, he understands that clearly. Um, but he had this idea that the seven last years, and this is a carryover, again, from Christianity, uh, it was seven years of tribulation. I don't know if it's exactly seven years. We see seven-year period in, um, in uh, Genesis with Joseph, and uh, we see blocks of seven other places in prophecy. This whole thing could be seven years. But I haven't got any proof that it's seven years. And um, he had it put in there. I never bothered to take it out. But I, I just want to qualify that. I am not convinced that this is exactly seven years. Um, when you read the prophecies, it could very well be uh, approximately seven years for all the things that are going to happen. And, and I hesitate, as I've said before, but I want to emphasize for those that might have just seen this uh, video and seen me presenting for the first time. Um, I, I really try and be careful about giving a time frame for the time of the end, because if I tell people that this, this deliverance is at least seven years away or eight years away because we haven't seen the war yet, People will get back in their comfortable chair and they put their feet up because they think they've got all this extra time to deal with. Well, I would like to say clearly that if you're not in place before this war, you will scramble all the way through this time. There's no question about that. So it's not good enough to think that you have seven years before Yeshua comes. The more important point is, is how long have we got to the war? That's how long you have to get your act together so that you can ride out the storm as in the days of Noah. That's what we have to worry about. So unless Noah made the preparation, and that included putting all the food, him gathering all the food and putting it into the ark, for the saving, it says, of his household. If he didn't gather all the food, I wonder if they would have went hungry. 
Well, they might have went hungry because God told him to gather the food. So if we don't do, if we don't take the warning that God has given to us so that we can prepare for what's coming, I'm not so sure if he's going to take care of us through this time. We don't really know. I don't want to be on the wrong side of that one and have to find out. So it looks like to me that he's given this warning to us of all this disaster that's coming so that we have the opportunity ahead of time to prepare. So here again, I don't like to say we have seven years left. The more important thing in my mind is how long is it to the war? And I understood just this morning is that Israel is gearing for war again. They've declared war again. And we know that this whole thing, Israel will be at the forefront of all of what's going to happen. This will be what brings on the war between the he-goat and the ram. It all has to do with Islam, Israel, and the West. So we're seeing um, definitely signs that we are getting very close to this. Okay. So let's move on now uh, from this period, move on to our deliverance. That's the good news. Uh, Matthew 24, 31, 30 and 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Why? Because the Holy One has just shown up and interrupted their party. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, we don't really understand what this means. I'm going to try and understand what this means. This is the God of the universe shows up at this little pinprick of a planet in the time of the end. This is the one that created all the stars, the whole universe, with everything, all the life that's in it. This is the most powerful influence in the whole universe just shows up at this planet. This is what it says, great glory. Great glory does not do this justice. This is the most powerful entity in the world shows up at this planet. Could it be that that's why it says that this planet's going to be ripped open from one end to the other? Because you've got this powerful being just show up. You know, you want to talk about gravity, you know, and the earth and gravity and the oceans and the tides moving back and forth. This is the effect, I understand, of the moon. So the water goes back and forth in the oceans just because there's a little heavenly body out there called the moon. What do you suppose is going to happen when the most powerful being in the universe shows up at this planet? This is why they cry, rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. This is the most powerful being in the universe. He comes with the glory of the holy angels, the glory of himself, and the glory of the Father, it says. This is what happens at his coming. And the question is asked in Revelation chapter 6 is who is able to stand? And we saw who was able to stand at this time. That's the 144,000 because they have been made ready. It says here that he, Yeshua, will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven even to the other. So God will gather with his angels those that are alive and ready to receive him. That would be the 144,000. This will happen at the second coming, which I'm proposing would be the Passover. The Passover is when God delivers his people from the evil one being fairy, Pharaoh, who was just a type of the evil one, Apollyon. First Thessalonians tells us, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. There's the good news of the gospel, but it's not over yet. There's still a thousand-year period where the plan of salvation is working itself out with God's help, of course, and with our help. That's going to be our topic uh, as well as the final great day um, tomorrow. So we're going to be looking at that tomorrow on the last great day. But they are ready to meet Yeshua, the 144,000 who are alive, those that remain until the coming of the Lord, and they will be swept up in the air to meet him in the air. And Paul goes on to say, therefore comfort one another with these words. Isn't that a comfort? I've told you all the bad news here. Now comfort yourself with the fact that if you die in this time, or if you're alive, you will be caught up together with Yeshua in the air. Is that good news? That's good news. That is good news. It's time to make the decision whether we want to be left on the ground to inhabit the earth through the millennium or be caught up together with him in the clouds, in the air. What's going to happen? Let's keep going. In Hebrews, Paul tells us, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, that's his first coming, to those who eagerly wait for him. I'll tell you what, the 144,000 will be eagerly waiting for him. They will be counting the days. 44 more days, 43 more days, 15 more days, they will be waiting for him. And I say this repeatedly, that in God's mercy, he's shown us how long we're going to have to endure for. And that's his love that he showed us this. You know, they've done studies and they've basically scientifically proven that if a person knows how long they have to do something for, they're much more able to complete it in the time frame that they have to do it in. God, in his infinite wisdom, has given us these time periods and the five months so that we will know exactly how long it is that we're going to have to endure. And we will be waiting eagerly for our deliverance. This is a loving God, absolutely a loving God. Revelation 6, verse 15 to 18, And the kings of the earth, the the great men, the rich men, the commanders, and the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks and the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand. What a lot of people don't realize when Yeshua comes back, according to his own word, and the words of the prophet, when Yeshua comes back, there will be only two groups of people. There will be no middle ground. That's what this last message to mankind is to do, is to separate the sheep from the goats. And when Yeshua comes, that's all he's going to do is do the separating. The decisions have already been made. He's just going to separate them. Those that are of the sheep, he will take up and they will meet him in the air. And those that have made a decision to reject Yeshua and his messengers, uh, they will scream for the rocks to fall on them and be hidden from them. The question is, who is able to stand? Verse 18 tells us, that it's the 144,000. Actually, that's not verse 18. That's um, the next chapter, which is, it should be verse 18 uh, in this same chapter because it's all one dialogue. 
and I say this again, we have a tendency to separate chapters and make one chapter about this and one chapter about that when these two chapters should uh, flow right into each other. The 144,000 is an answer to the question, who is able to stand? Very, very clear here. This also parallels Isaiah chapter 24, verse 1. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surfaces and scatters its uh, abroad its inhabitants. Distorts its surface. This is, this is what I'm talking about, this powerful uh, gravitational force that's going to be going on. He will have everyone's attention. It shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with the master, as with the maid, so with the mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. Anytime it makes a list like that, it's doing it so that it includes everyone. No one escapes this. And this is why it does this. We see the same kind of li list in Revelation 19, because it's the same story. They're both talking about the second coming. You can compare Isaiah 24 with the second coming. It's exactly the same event. It goes on to say, the land shall be entirely emptied and, and, and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken his word. Another place in Jeremiah, I believe it's Jeremiah 4. Um, my, I just can't remember if it's Jeremiah 4. You can look this up. It says when he comes, the, the, the dead will be spread from one end of earth to the other. This is the same picture that we have here. The wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. The righteous will be raised uh, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, both those that have died in Christ, as Paul said, and those that are alive in Christ when he comes. But everyone else will suffer the penalty, which is death. And the Lord will, and the land will be utter, entirely emptied. What is it going to be emptied of? It's going to be emptied of people. That's what it means. This is what it's talking about. The ones that have gone before in the verse prior to this. Goes on to say in uh, 4 verse 6 of Isaiah 24, The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth language. Who are the haughty people? What is a haughty person? A haughty person has an eye issue. And I find, you know, a little play on words. The letter in the center of the word pride is I. You see, I don't know about you, but those that will not accept a new idea, they actually have an I issue because they think they have it all figured out. Well, at some point, we've got to figure out that we don't all have it figured out, and God is the only one that has it all figured out, and we've got to ask him to help us to figure this out. The world languishes and fades away. So the haughty people are those that have an eye issue. The problem that people have in being saved and lost is the problem that they've got honestly. Now I say that kind of carefully, but they've got it honestly because after Adam and Eve fell, we were all fallen human beings and were subject to what fallen human beings fall to, and that's pride. We all have an eye problem that we have to deal with it, and we need eye salve so that we can see correctly, and get rid of our eye problem that we can't see. So I would suggest here that the haughty people are all those that have an eye problem, and those are all the lost. Every person that's lost is going to be lost because they had an eye problem. Whatever that looked like, it might be different for everyone. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. This is the penalty that they will feel because of this. That's why in Daniel it says they changed times and laws. The whole world has accepted this system 
So they've accepted this. This goes together with Daniel 7.25 perfectly. And Daniel 7.25 is during the time that the little horn is, has gotten its power. And they will have everyone on the earth under this new religious system. And this will go forward until the end. The reason why God pours out this on the wicked is because of this. So that tells us that we don't want to have anything to do with people that claim that God has changed his law through Yeshua who died at the cross. It's just simply not true. And prophecy tells us otherwise. Very clear uh, that prophecy tells us otherwise. I could, I could further explain this, is that this word ordinance can have a substitute of statutes. Sometimes that same word is used as statutes. And the laws, of course, would be Torah. So this is at the end of time when uh, the Lord comes from his place. Uh, people have changed the Torah and the statutes and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left. And I've just put in, in uh, parentheses here, those few men are left. People say, well, that means there's going to be people left in, on the earth when the destruction happens. That's absolutely true. They're numbered as 144,000. This is what the book of Revelation says. So Isaiah tells us that there's going to be a few people at the end of this. Revelation tells us the number of those few people that are uh, at the end of this. So there doesn't need to be any confusion about who, who these few men are. Revelation tells us that there are those that are numbered among the 144,000. Uh, so we don't have to be confused on who this is. Where do the righteous go when they're caught up into the clouds? Well, here again, all we need to do is go back to what Yeshua says. This is what people aren't doing, and this is what I keep telling people. Look at what Yeshua said. But so often, we're so busy reading Ezekiel or somebody else other than some of the plain statements that Yeshua said in the gospel. Let's have a look what he said. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of what? Heaven. Heaven. That's what he said. Well, the question is, is that what he meant? Or is that just what he said? Well, I would say we want to take the obvious meaning of the text, and then if there's something else that's going on, then maybe we have to reconsider. But let's see how he uses this text just a couple chapters further. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter where? Kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father Where's my father? In heaven. I mean, how clear do we need to get here? So Yeshua said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven where the father is, you see, that's why people are taken up into the cloud and meet the Lord in the air, because a, de a fire devours everyone left alive on the earth, and they are taken up into heaven. And Yeshua says also in Matthew 24 that unless those days are shortened, what days? These days. Unless these days are shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect saved sake, that's those that are saved, for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. In other words, the world is going to be at a point of self-destruction, implosion, if you will, before Yeshua comes back. And Yeshua knows, knew that. That's why he said that. If he didn't show up on day 1335, 
You see, the 144,000 have not received mortality or immortality on day 1334. They receive mortality on 1335. So unless these days are shortened to there, there wouldn't be any flesh. In other words, if Yeshua is going to come on day 1336, no one would be left alive. Why does God show up at that point? Because he needs to make a, dis a demonstration that if Satan is in charge, the whole thing will destroy itself. And that's what he's doing. He's allowing Satan to come in and be that abomination to desolation and show everyone that his kingdom is the best way it should be. But the reality of it is, is Satan will bring this world to destruction. And that's the whole point of what God is allowing here to demonstrate to the whole universe and to everyone on the planet that Satan's plans on rulership will not hold up. So at the end, um, Yeshua says that those that do the will of the Father are the ones that will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why they're taken up in the air and they will meet the Lord in the air. Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. And he said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Not the kingdom of earth, but the kingdom of heaven. You see, there is a time period when Yeshua comes back and he takes those to heaven. We see this very clearly in chapter 6 and 7 of Revelation. It says he saw a great, John saw a great multitude before the throne in heaven. In John, he tells the disciples just before he left, John 13, 33 to 36, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and you all, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have lo love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? This is what he was thinking about. Where are you going? Where I'm going, you cannot follow me. Now, these are red letters, and this is what I say again, just read what Yeshua said. Where I am going, where was he going? He was going to the Father's house, to the kingdom of heaven. Where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. These are the words of Yeshua. Now, once we get to the book of Revelation, we can see that these ones that were taken at his second coming are before the throne room in heaven. This, is he this has led, I found this very interesting, this has led a lot of people who hear this for the first time that have these different ideas about a kingdom on earth. They are starting to say now, you may have met some of these people, they're starting to say now, well, you know, we might go to heaven for a little while, but we're going to come back right away and we're going to rule here on earth. I'll tell you what, there's no way that this earth is going to be able to sustain life after the end comes. It's going to be reduced to what it looked like at the beginning before the creation of anything. It was without form and void. And we know from the book of Revelation, which is the rest of the story, it's not until after the millennium that the earth is made new so people can live here again. There's a thousand years, according to the book of Revelation, where the earth will be desolate. People say, well, you know, a thousand years is a long time. Well, I have a question. <clears throat> How long was the earth without form and void before the creation of the sun and the moon 
and the plants and the seas and the dividing of the seas and, and all of this. Could it be that the earth in its raw form was there for a long time before uh, the actual creation? That's just a discussion for another day. But the earth will be reduced to nothingness without form and void. And we see in Revelation at that time that a great chain is put around Satan because he is here. He's on the earth at this time. A mighty angel comes down from heaven and chains Satan to this planet, also fulfilling an aspect of a strong man taking the scapegoat into the wilderness, an uninhabited place um, where he is uh, bound in the wilderness. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, after these things I looked, this is after Yeshua comes, after the 144,000, it says, who's able to stand? It goes into this view here. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. These are the ones that have gotten the victory through all ages and have listened to the voice of reason and conscience uh, from the Spirit of God who works in the hearts of all men, John says, that have come into the world. This is all those that have been resurrected at the second coming and who now are before the throne of God. This is the part where... The resurrection happens at the time Yeshua comes, which is very clear in Revelation um, chapter 6 and, and chapter 7. This is the resurrection right here. Does it say resurrection? We don't need to uh, speculate. This is the resurrection because that's what happens when Yeshua comes. This is the great multitude that are resurrected. Let Paul says those that have died in Christ will be raised and meet those that are alive in the air. Where are they taken? They're taken to the throne room of heaven. And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. Revelation 7, 12 to 14, saying, Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Then one of the elders saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? And here again, this is an obvious thing to us. But these are the elders. These are the 24 elders. It said earlier on in chapter 5, 4, 5, 6, and 7 are all one dialogue. These are the elders, the 24 elders, who are in heaven today. They ask the question, where did they come from? Well, that's kind of an interesting question. That's kind of if we take it back to Job. Uh, in the book of Job, where God asked Satan, where does he come from? Well, we can see it was pretty obvious. But the question is, what have you been up to, Satan? And this is the same kind of thing here. The question is asked by the 24 elders, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? The answer is, and I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who came out or come out of great tribulation, right here, great tribulation, and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So here, here we have, and, and I've been trying to make this clear all week, is the events that surround the close of judgment or probation for this earth I believe, when we study the prophecies, they are clearly portrayed. Now, we have gathered information, data from all the prophecies, 
And that's why we've been able to put things in their proper place and see a much more detailed picture of the time of the end. Why? Because we have a loving God that he does not want this to take us by surprise whatsoever. So he's given us details in the prophecies so that we can not only be ready for ourselves, we can get our families ready, we can get our loved ones ready, and we can warn the world that decision time for this planet has come. So let's close with prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you again for your goodness and mercy to us. And Father, we want to accept you on a daily basis. We ask that you complete the work that you have started in our lives, that we may be ready either to give our lives for you or to die beforehand and be ready when you come back or be alive and standing when you come back and ready to go to the Father's house to celebrate with all those redeemed of all ages. We thank you for this understanding. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen.